Hello, Tom Larecchia here with the New Theory Podcast. We have a very special guest today calling in from Singapore. Dr. Julian Hosp is a blockchain expert. This guy is a world-renowned thought leader on cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and we'll talk a little bit about decentralization. He's also a best-selling author who wrote a book, 25 Stories I Would Tell my younger self, I wish I could have done that. So, Dr. Haas, welcome to the New the- Theory Podcast. How are you doing today from Singapore? Tom, it's a pleasure to be on and excited <laughs> to talk to you. That reminded me of one of my longest introductions. I think it was north of 30 seconds. I'm a little winded, but it's worth it. All right. So, let's dive right in. We'd like to start off with what is or what were your formative years? Where did you grow up and uh, what makes you you? I grew up in Austria, Europe. I went to school there. When I was 16, I moved to the U.S. I went to high school there, which was, I felt, really important for me to kind of broaden my kind of thinking and everything. I became a professional kite surfer afterwards. I surfed for 10 years. It was fantastic. I traveled the world. I studied medicine, worked as a medical doctor for a little bit over a year, Um, missed my freedoms I had as a kite surfer. I quit, moved to Hong Kong, um, started my own business there, stepped away from that after two and a half years, met my current co-founders and uh, started a company in 2015 called 10X that's now, yeah, we're getting close to a billion dollars, so really exciting. <laughs> wow, that, wow, wow, wow. All right, well, first, I'd like to tell you that I spent the week in Vienna and I gained 10 pounds and I literally <laughs> ate Wiener Schnitzel. I, I, I ate, I, I ate. Wiener schnitzel, I got to say, 27 meals. I was I was obsessed. And uh, you need to find me a great place in the States because uh, I love Wiener schnitzel. <laughs> all right. So, so with that being said, all right. So, so hold on. There's a, there's a lot there, right? So, so you went to medical school and you became a medical doctor. And there's a lot of time, thought, studying, going into that. And you did a year and then you pivoted. So why do you think you spent, you know, all that investment and then pivoted? If you could kind of give uh, color a little bit uh, to, the, to that, uh, that pivot. I mean, for me, uh, the reason I do most of the things that I'm doing, also why I'm interested in blockchain or why I studied medicine is because yeah. I'm a really curious and scientific person. So I love to understand the nature of things. So for me, I studied medicine not necessarily because of that reason that most doctors become doctors because they want to help people. For me, it was really more of an egotistical thing. Like I wanted to understand the human body and that's why I was really interested in it. Um, so suddenly when I was working in a hospital, I felt, uh, obviously I felt all this disease and I felt all this negativity. I mean, duh, this is normal for uh-huh. in, working in a hospital. But this was what I felt and I was really missing my freedoms and all this positivity that I had when I was a professional athlete. So for me, I know I, I just I had this really awesome life and suddenly I wasn't so happy in, in this place and I said okay I, I need to do something about it uh, move you're not a tree <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> you moved on a different trajectory okay yeah. and, and and I respect that you know, the reason why I asked for the about the pivots I respect it because you kind of um, lamented a certain life right and, and you're sort of going down that path but it takes a lot of courage to say hey this isn't for me. All right, I'm go- I'm gonna jump right in uh, to blockchain because um, um, there's a lot a lot going on, and let's start off with as I have a I have a four year old son named Giuseppe, right? So as if I'm four years old, uh, four years old. Please start off with what is blockchain technology? <laughs> so I would talk to your son and say, hey, listen, <laughs> um, in this digital world, yeah. um, if we in a digital world don't have a central body like your dad to make sure that no one cheats in a family with the money so that I'm on my iPad on my phone and I just copy paste money um, on my iPad. I could make $1 become $5 and $10 and $20. It's really simple because I do copy paste on my iPad. So in order that this doesn't happen, we need a central someone that's one person or one party that makes sure that all the people in the household, all the people in the family, don't cheat on their iPad so they can't create money so that your pocket money doesn't go up in like unlimited. So we have this central kind of body, uh, in this case with that. Now in the real world, this is the bank and or central government, central institutions. They make sure that people don't just go and copy paste their money and they are in charge. Now 
if you trust your dad, and I'm pretty sure you do, then that's all good. And your dad is probably not going to cheat you over because you're his son, so it's all fine. No. But in the real world, um, yeah, well, this is not your dad and you're not <laughs> their son. So who knows what these things are going to do to you, right? It's, well, you have to trust them. And it, this trust is very unilateral because they don't really need to trust you. Um, they don't care. Um, they are in full control. Okay, so this is the strategy we're going to do. Let's say we don't trust you, Dad. And we do trust, but let's just say for the sake of this example, but we do it this way. We don't need your dad to keep check on how much money we have because what we do is we check each other. The way this works is every member of the family, every member of the group that we're going to use, whenever we send someone money or we want to receive money, we just tell all the others. So if you send money to someone, to your friend, you tell me and I'll tell everyone else that you just send a dollar to your friends. And if we do this in a community and everybody communicates really fast among each other, then, and with computers, this is really easy, then at some point, actually, we don't need this central body anymore because we just talk to each other all the time. Um, in order for this, these records to stay safe, what we're going to do is we just fix a certain amount of times. So we say, you know what, every 10 minutes, we just compare and compare our notes and be sure that we can agree on who actually did something in the last 10 minutes. And whenever we agree on this, we say, okay, agreed. We find what's called consensus. So we all agree. And um, then we can just start a new block, a new block of time, a new block in the blockchain. And yeah, and we just save these blocks and we build on top of them. And so what happens is at some point, we actually don't need the central body anymore because we agree and we just communicate among each other. And so what happens is we have these block of times and yeah, we don't need this central body anymore who make sure that we don't cheat in our iPads. Okay, so, wow, okay. You actually, that was actually a very simple explanation because I've heard some people talk about it before and, and I'm, I have an MBA and I'm fancy myself as a semi-smart person. I still don't understand it, but but you said it, you said it uh, eloquently. Okay, so one, and I'm gonna just do what, I, what, I'm, what I'm filtering. One is there's checks and balances. Uh, two, um, it's kind of a, it is a zero sum game. And number three is just as long as one person is willing to offer and another person is willing to accept this currency, if those three things are met, this is this operates under a perfect assumption that it would always balance itself out. Is it, am I right on those three assumptions? Yeah, it's a very good summary of that, yeah. Okay, so which brings us to this ecosystem. I believe, what is there, 21 million Bitcoins out there or how many, or do we know? Yeah, yeah. So you know it exactly. I mean, the maximum amount that can ever be created. So this 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 currency doesn't hyperinflate. It, it has a, a limited, a finite amount. It's a little bit less than twenty one million. It's it, it's an asymptotic approach. So it's slightly less, but you could say it's twenty one million. At the moment, we are around sixteen sixteen and a half million. Okay. So 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 with that said, though, but when you go digital and you go digital currency and you go you know electronic ecosystems. They're subject, you know, they're electronic, so they're subject to hacking. So why can't I hack into this ecosystem if I'm a high-end hacker and steal Julian's and Tom's Bitcoins? So that's where, in my opinion, there's a lot of genius in in the blockchain technology and, and in Bitcoin. And I think this genius is really underappreciated. Uh, the way this works is if you think of Gmail. So in Gmail, in theory, you could have an unlimited amount of email addresses. And... With every email address, in theory, you could have an unlimited possibilities of passwords. Now, the only way Gmail works so that you can actually log into your email is because you tell everyone your email address so they can actually send you emails, but you don't tell anyone your password that's associated to that. So you have like this public address, which is your, your email address, and you have a private address, which is your password. Now, the only ones besides you who can connect those two is Gmail themselves. They have a, a database, that database is secure so they can't necessarily read it. But so the way it works is you go on the Gmail website, type in your public address, your email address, and then you type in your private address, which is your password. And they make sure do these things match. And then yes, you can log into your Gmail account. And then you're the only one who can actually send emails out of there. So basically what you can do is everyone can send emails to your public address, your email address, but you're the only one who can send from your public address because you're the only one who knows the private address to that public address. Now, this works because there's a central body, Gmail, 
who matches those two, public and private address. Now, what we have found is that there are some very interesting mathematical numbers, and that comes down to cryptography, which means there are certain relationships of really, 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 really large numbers, and these numbers have hundreds of digits, so these numbers are insanely large. But these two numbers can be connected the exact same way. And they're connected in a way that if you know the, pri uh, the public address, so this is the, the, like your email, there is a, a very, very difficult way to understand what is the password, so the private key. But anyone who has the private key, so this password, automatically knows the public key, which is the address that someone sends to. Correct. And people found this in cryptography. So the genius is that in Bitcoin, what they do is, when you start and you want to join Bitcoin, by a total random number generator, you get a private address. So this is your password. You don't tell anyone about this. But with this, you get your public address. It doesn't have to be stored anywhere because this is just a natural correlation. So all you do is, and that's where the genius of not being able to hack the system comes in, as long as no one has access to your private key, this, 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 this password, then no one can actually steal your Bitcoin. The big problem where people get hacked is, is because they leave this private key on their computer or they leave it lying around or they have a phishing or, or some software in their computer on their phone and then the, it just gets stolen. But so the genius is there's actually no database that we hear in the news all the time with companies where hackers get into this database and they manage to get data out there because this database in Bitcoin doesn't exist. And so what this to me is always this fascinating kind of thing. Um, I, I mean, I'm simplifying it a lot what, right now, what happens with cryptography, but this basic concept of I can give you a private key, your password, that connects automatically to a public key that you can give to anyone because they can send Bitcoin to this address, but you're the only one who can log in because you're the only one who knows that password, and no one can guess that password just from knowing your public address, your, your public key. And this is to me really genius, and that's what is so fascinating to me about uh, about Bitcoin because it makes it so difficult to hack unless someone manages to steal your password. And that's the same as in the real world. I mean, if you have a phishing software or something that's, that detracts your password from your Gmail account, yeah, you have the same problem. Okay, now, there's various types of currency. So, as I understand Bitcoin... If I'm pronouncing it correctly, Ethereum, what is the difference? Okay, because let's say we're listening. Great, I buy into the concept of blockchain. I understand that people are willing to trade this. I'm okay with the security and keep it private. Now, which brings to roughly two or three big digital currencies. Uh, if you could run through, you know, what they are, what, you know, what are the differences? And are you agnostic towards, hey, just as long as you get into the game or you prefer one or the other. Um, so if you could run us through that. Definitely. Um, you mentioned two really important ones, Bitcoin and Ethereum. I am totally agnostic to the different type of cryptocurrency because I am I'm a very big proponent of the underlying system, the blockchain, and that is common among all of them. Everything else is just different applications of it. Bitcoin, we talked about, it's basically money. So what's stored among the participants is the accounting unit of how many Bitcoins you own or someone else owns. In Ethereum, you store different information. And what you store in Ethereum is pretty much computing language. So Ethereum is like a general purpose computer that's decentralized, meaning that instead of storing money on all these computers that are all around the world, you store bits of zeros and ones to tell you what a program is doing and what it's not doing. Now you might be asking, why would I need this? I could just use the cloud. Yeah, you could use an Amazon Cloud or Microsoft or whatever you want to use, but they are centralized bodies, meaning if at some point they have a problem with the government or someone wants to hack them or someone wants to shut them down, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, but it's a centralized attack. So as long as you have enough energy that goes against this one centralized thing, at some point it's going to fall down. In Ethereum, all these computers are all over the world, and every computer synchronizes with all the other computers. So even if you take a computer out, it doesn't really matter because you still have all the other thousands of computers that run the same program. So basically Ethereum does nothing else than not storing the Bitcoins, but storing zeros and ones to tell you what, what the program is doing right now. Okay. Um, 
It's people call Bitcoin like a blockchain generation type one. They call Ethereum a blockchain generation type two because it allows for way more complex uh, systems. It's so-called Turing complete. So that allows a lot of additional kind of things to, to use to, to run on this. Um, personally, I am a, I, I like Bitcoin. I like Ethereum. I think both of them are going to do well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of critics against them, but I personally think that's just because they are number one and number two in the world. And um, yeah, obviously people <laughs> always want to see the, some underdog <laughs> go against uh, Goliath. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I totally see those two. Um, now, what else do we have? At the end of the day, it always comes down to storing some type of information in a decentralized manner. And there's a, a couple of various things you can do. Um, for example, you can totally anonymize cryptocurrencies. Now, some people might think, hmm, haven't I heard that Bitcoin is anonymous? It's not really because, um, and we've seen this in several locations, there's uh, this case of Silk Road where someone was laundering money and selling drugs. Right. And the FBI was able to track this person down because that person at one instant in time made a slight mistake where the identity was not revealed, but there was additional information to the transaction. And because every transaction is recorded forever, because what the blockchain basically is, is it's the transaction history that ever happened since the first transaction till now. The FBI had strong enough computers to back calculate everything and they could see and prove that this, this transaction right now that just revealed information that was totally irrelevant per se was actually the same person who did all these other illegal transactions. And so Bitcoin is pseudo anonymous. It's not fully anonymous. And there's currencies, for example, Dash or Monero or Zcash. And these currencies, they really bring an extra layer of security. Um, they, they bring what we, what we call an extra layer of privacy. So one thing is anon uh, an anonymity and the other thing is privacy. Um, there's some, in my opinion, also fair requests on why we actually need that. Why does money have to be completely private, completely anonymous? Um, because what you do with a currency that cannot be traced, no one knows what's happening to it. Um, why would you use this for anything legal if you, I mean, why would you, why would you want to use this? I mean, what do you have to hide? And there are some fair arguments on both sides. Um, there are these arguments, you could buy a lot of drugs, you could pay, do illegal things, pay for child pornography, you could uh, pay for child labor, you could smuggle, uh, you could pay terrorists. So there are some very fair arguments to that. But then you also have the counter argument where you'd say, okay, look, but um, you don't always want everyone else to know what you're spending your money on. Um, something very simple. Uh, imagine you have a total legitimate sus subscription for porn. And you want to pay those twenty dollars a month or so thirty dollars? I have no idea. So the question is, if you pay with Bitcoin, everyone in theory could back calculate that you're paying for this totally legitimate and legal service. But maybe you wouldn't want that. Maybe you would want to hide that, or you want to make a donation to someone, and you don't. And this is a totally legitimate, fair uh, donation. It's you just don't want everyone to know. With Bitcoin, it's, at some point, this could be very difficult because if computers become strong enough, it's totally transparent. And so with these very, very private and anonymous currencies, yes, they can be misused. But personally, I also believe they will have a lot of great hope. And the last category to close all that is, um, so we have currencies, we have these very anonymous currencies, we have computers like Ethereum. There are some competitors being built uh, for Ethereum. And then you have a lot of these so-called tokens. Um, also, for example, my own company, 10X, is such a token. We use the Ethereum network for very specific use cases. And there's use cases for everything. There's use cases for gambling, something we don't do and we don't endorse, but there's use cases for gambling. There's use cases for insurances, use cases for prediction markets, use cases for betting, uh, use cases for literally anything that you ever think of can be used as such tokens. For example, our own company, we have a debit card uh, where people can spend cryptocurrencies. And this is also connected to the Ethereum network running in this decentralized manner. And so there's a lot, a lot of these various different use cases. Okay. So you, I want to, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I do want to ask a question about Silk Road and, and, um, in the U S um, and again, there's a lot of interest. They want to protect their, 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 their values and their assets, assets, especially the banks. So like with Silk Road and I know there was a lot of, um, like ransom demands electronically, uh, for Bitcoin and, just Bitcoin got a real bad rap or a real 
kind of negative press when it first launched. Um, do you, you know, is there some legitimacy to that or, or, you know, it was just basically an element got into it that shouldn't have. And, and again, maybe it's kind of the powers that be that were like slanting a little bit because, you know, it, it, at least up to maybe two, three years ago, when you thought about Bitcoin, Bitcoin specifically, it was kind of negative, but now it's starting to, you know, come to light that it, that it is indeed a, uh, a positive ecosystem. But why do you think you got up to a bad start here in the U.S. from maybe a uh, PR perspective? Well, that's an excellent question. I think that has a lot to do with um, uh, what is the natural kind of behavior of people who want to do more illegal behavior and what's the natural behavior of people that want to do more legal behavior. Generally, um, people who are more prone to do illegal behavior, their tolerance for risk is definitely higher because otherwise they wouldn't be willing to do these illegal things. And people who don't want to do, do illegal things, their tolerance of risk is lower or it's a bit, in, in, a, in a sense, it's a bit more calculated in a very smart way. So as soon as this new thing comes up that's not really clear, generally speaking, people who are more prone to do illegal behavior jump on it way faster because for them, a potential downside does not really exist because they are already in illegal behaviors. But the potential upside is really, really high because suddenly I can do all these new different things. And we have seen the same thing with the internet. Uh, we have seen the exact same thing now with blockchain as well, with cryptocurrencies. And then it takes a little bit of time until the actual legitimate use cases come in where people start actually calculating risks and rewards. And they realize, hmm, actually, this is not so stupid. There's actually a lot of really great applications to that. Um, yes, it got in a bad rap, but if we actually focus on some really great of these things, uh, focusing on helping the underbanks become uh, having access to the to, to monetary systems, uh, making a lot more of the banking systems way more efficient, uh, making uh, certain smart contracts or making uh, certain fiduciary things way more efficient, safer. It's actually really great. And then it just takes step by step until more and more and more of these very legitimate players come into these markets and wipe out and also diminish the percentage of the illegal behavior that happens in something. Um, I, I think in the internet, it's exactly the same thing. The internet started with a lot of dark stuff and with a lot of illegal stuff and with a lot of not so good stuff. And if you look at it today, I don't think anyone today who, who is using the internet would ever want to give up using the internet. Because, and for regulators, it's also okay that way because the amount of illegal stuff happening on the internet is there, but it's so small that the legal stuff is way more important. So yes, they're going to find regulations and they try to fight the illegal stuff, but the legal side is so much more important. And cryptocurrencies, especially now that more and more countries actually starting to regulate cryptocurrencies and making clear what's white, what's black, they will attract way, way more, more and more players who are in this, in this kind of ecosystem and who are bringing a lot of money, a lot of credibility, a lot of know-how, and all these things will really work. And I'm pretty sure if we stand there in 10 days, in 10 years, um, I'm pretty sure the majority of transactions happening on blockchain are 100% legit, 100% legal, uh, very, very few illegal use cases, just like today. Yes, they will have to be fought, but it will have transitioned completely. Okay, so, wow, that was a great explanation. I call it the eighth grade dance effect. In the US, it'll be like an eighth grade dance. So the cool kids, like nobody will dance, so the cool kids go out there. Once the cool kids go out there, a few more people go out there. And then once everyone goes out there, then the dance floor is packed, right? And then it's okay. Kind of like the adoption of the internet, and it appears to be the same thing for cryptocurrency. So so who should who should use cryptocurrency? Who who, who in the US listening to this? Because we're we're about we're about 70% US, some UK, some Canada, some Euro. But let's say in the US mainly. Who should use uh, uh, Bitcoin? Who should use uh, cryptocurrency as a user, in your opinion? Who could benefit? Um, so here's the really fair answer to that. Actual use cases right now are very rare. Um, I once had this blog post and it got a lot of criticism because it kind of laid out the truth about cryptocurrencies right now. And my the blog post was titled, um, which cryptocurrencies among the top 100 actually has a live use case. So basically the question is, which of the 100 cryptocurrencies that the largest ones, the most important ones in the world, can you actually use or actually are not just some hype, but actually have a real product? And it was less than 10. 
So oh, that, wow. means, that means less than 10% of the actual cryptocurrencies had a use case. And most of these use cases were also very, very slim and were sometimes arguable if you want to talk, if you want to call it this way. Correct. So um, my answer to this is the following. Um, it's probably very hard if, uh, and, and I'm going to define it into three groups. Yeah. Um, the first group is if you are someone that really wants to have an actual use case, you're not very open to new things, then probably right now I would just pay out and uh, pay attention to cryptocurrencies. Um, I would encourage you though to move over into group two. And group two is the group that says, you know what? I think this is something new. I'm not 100% sure if I like it, if I don't like it. It might be totally crap, but it might be really cool. You know what? Let me take $50 and let me go onto an exchange, for example, Coinbase.com. I'm not affiliated with them. I'm, I'm totally just giving you one of the, my opinion, most legit exchanges in the US. And you use your credit card to buy Bitcoin or Ethereum worth 50 US dollars. And you expect in the minute that you buy these $50 that your money is gone. You will never ever get this money back. But what you get is you get experience, you get learning, you get uh, you understand how these things move, you, you kind of familiarize yourself a little bit because suddenly you are in it. You're not just looking at it, you're in it. And for $50, I personally believe you're going to get actually a really great experience because you're totally going to be ahead of the curve. And maybe you're not going to move further. Maybe you don't care. Maybe you, you really don't think this is good. But chances are, first of all, that this ecosystem grows a lot and maybe your $50 become worth more. Who knows? It might become less, it might become more. But also you're going to learn a lot from this, which in my opinion is way more valuable. And then maybe at some point right now, you're going to move into the third group. And this third group is a group that really understands the value of this technology, of blockchain, of cryptocurrencies. And you might start actually understanding these cryptocurrencies and you think, hey, wow, there's this, this new cryptocurrency. Um, you know what? Um, it might be a good investment or you know what? It might be great to support this currency or it might be a great use case for what I'm doing in my business or something that I want to build up. Or it might be something that I'm actually going to be involved in because maybe my business makes sense to be put on the blockchain or it, may, it might be interesting to accept these cryptocurrencies. And so obviously... I would love you to at least move into group two, where you at least try and, and dip your toe into the water. And of, of course, the best scenario would be the more and more people, and I call this, they become crypto fit. They really understand that, yeah, group three, it can be very exciting and interesting. And that, that's amazing because that, again, follows a marketing model of a non-user, a dabbler, and, uh, and making it a brand new use of choice. Um, before we wrap up, I do have a few more questions because, Jordan, this is uh, Dr. Hospice has been... I'm taking so many notes that, that when you're done speaking, I'm still writing notes and I forget to ask questions. Um, what uh, the government, you know, um, um, I know, I believe I watched the documentary, the government, U.S. government came out and said, hey, um, it's OK, it's legal, but I can't imagine them also being happy about it. So what's your take on, you know, how the U.S. government is reacting to cryptocurrency? Are they taking it serious? Are they fostering it? Are they hindering it? What's the U.S. government stance in your opinion? So, I mean, I think at the moment, many governments, not only the U.S., but many governments are taking a very, very wrong stance. And the, the worst stance a government can do, in my opinion, my opinion at the moment, is doing nothing. Um, doing nothing creates uncertainty for people that are interested in being in that space. And uh, uncertainty always leads to people not acting. So what happens is if you want large players in the U.S. to actually move into that market, the U.S. government and many governments around the world would have to take a decision and say, that's white, that's black. And for some reasons, many governments around the world are still waiting a lot. And I think this waiting right now comes down to having this dilemma of large financial institutions pressuring governments not to move right now because these financial institutions have to catch up. They are so far behind with everything that if the government would suddenly take action, it would suddenly bring such an influx of technology and, and, and capital and talent that a lot of the large financial institutions really would struggle. So on the one hand, you have this slowing down based on traditional players that want governments to not take a decision right now. And on the other hand, you have startups, innovative companies who want governments to take a decision. There are some uh, governments in the world, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and there's a couple more going to follow in the next couple of months that have made a stance. And I, I think many people are always worried that as soon as the U.S. is going to take a stance, 
that they're going to regulate Bitcoin. Yeah, but regulation is actually not bad. It's actually good as long as the regulation is clear and it defines clearly of what's white and what's black. And this fear for people that any government in the world, and I, I'm, I would really put, I would take up any bet on this probably. If I, I would take the bet that any serious government, I'm not talking about some crazy dictatorian kind of governments, but I'm really talking about first world governments. None of these governments will make blockchain technologies, cryptocurrencies illegal. Because what happens if a government or someone makes something illegal that's decentralized, you can't stop it. So there's no way you could stop Bitcoin. It, it's just not possible. Because even if you say Bitcoin is illegal, well, so what? It's open source. Everyone has access to it. It's just about whether you want or you don't want to do it. But if you make it illegal, who is not going to access it? Exactly. All those people that want to stick to the law, who are the proper citizens, who are not going to stick to it. The people who want to break the law, people who want to do illegal things. So the only thing that these governments are actually going to be able to do is they're going to stop the legal side from growing and the illegal side from grow up. And, and the illegal side grows even more. It would be the same as in governments where the internet gets blocked. The only thing you're doing is you're totally pushing down the entire uh, population. And so I don't see any government totally outlawing cryptocurrencies. But what these governments have to do is they have to take a stance and they have to explain what's white and what's black because that would bring so much influx of talent of capital, of companies, and that would really help the entire ecosystem. Okay, so I, I, I just have a few more questions, but I, I do have to ask, and I'm not, listen, I want to preface this, I'm not a super uber conspiracy guy, right? But I do want to give some validity, you know, that the Rothschilds and there's certain folks that have a big vested interest in the Federal Reserve and, and the IRS and 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 they just, these powerful, you know, like entities are vested and own or control a lot of the monetary systems in many countries. This is a threat to that. So how do you see kind of the old guard um, respond? I'm not talking about the government, just kind of the old guard that's out there without being too conspiracy focused. What do you think the old guard is going to look upon these cryptocurrencies and, and does it matter? So it's not going to matter at all to them. Um, they just need some time. Um, we're really heavily involved in Singapore, right? So I can't tell you how it is in the US, yeah. but I just don't think it's going to be any much different there. So here in Singapore, we're one of the leading startups when it comes to cryptocurrencies and blockchain, which means we get invited once a month around to go to the Central Bank of Singapore, give them some updates, what we're doing, what do we see, um, what is our input on a lot, a lot of things from a security standpoint, from a tech standpoint, from a legal standpoint, from a whatever. And so one thing has become really clear is that the Singapore government, and in my opinion, probably every large government in the world, is actually working on a cryptocurrency in the background. So what I just think sure. is, and sure. no matter if you believe in conspiracy theories or not, and I'm not going to dig into those yeah. too much, I really just want to point out some facts. Yeah. What these governments are all doing is they just replace your US dollar that you see, and they just give you a coin for it. But they have the same rules, they have, it has the same kind of principles that your dollar has right now, meaning they're in full control of the money supply, they have full control of everything, but you have your blockchain and your cryptocurrency called the US dollar coin or whatever you want to call it. And it's not going to happen tomorrow, it's not going to happen in a year, but you might be able to see this in a couple of years and probably in the next 10 or 15 years, it's totally normal that you are going to have Yes, you're going to have your US dollar bills, but at the same time, you're going to have credit cards or maybe fewer credit cards and you're going to have um, your US dollar coins. And I think more and more governments are going to start doing this. They're going to start introducing these systems. And so it's going to just be the same old with a different picture on top. That, that, that You explained that perfectly. Now, um, I just said before I my final question, how can somebody get started? So I'm listening and you know what? I'm sold. Dr. Hosp. Um, you know what? You convinced me. I want to get involved. What's a good starting point uh, for somebody who wants to uh, get into cryptocurrency? I mean, I would, I mean, always, I mean, don't listen to anyone, not even me telling you what to buy, um, whether you should buy or nothing, right? I mean, don't be a lemming. Think. Um, don't follow blindly. So do your own kind of thinking and do your own kind of soul searching. 
But um, when, and whenever you get involved, use capital that you're willing to lose. That's really important. That's why I also say, hey, use the fifty dollars, um, because that it, it, again, it's a it, it, in the worst case, it's a really great learning example. In the best case, you're gonna make some money of it. But if you want to get started, I'm just gonna give you some platforms or some yeah. places to start. I think in the U.S., um, one of the best exchanges. So you need an exchange where you can actually buy these cryptocurrencies. One of the best exchanges is Coinbase. Um, it's you can use your credit card and you can buy your cryptocurrency directly with a credit card. There's a website called Coin Market Cap, and it gives you a very great overview of all the legit large coins in the world. Um, it tracks them as a as a, a performance and, and gives you some insight on those. I think uh, that's uh, really really great. And if you want to be like if you want to read a bit of the news or you just want to stay on top of that, um, you could use for example CoinDesk.com. Um, I'm not affiliated with any of these sites or platforms. Um, I use them myself. I think they are fantastic, and it's probably going to give you a, a, a good input on the one hand how to get started, how to buy your first, how to get an overview. And how to stay on top of the news. Wow, that, that, that's some great resources, and I'll include them uh, in the wraparound of this podcast. So, tell I mean, you've been, you've been, Dr. Haas, you've been more than um, generous with your time. You're calling in from Singapore at the start of your day. You're a busy man. Uh, so, just tell us a little bit about your business specifically and how can our listeners find you? Sure. Um, I mean, when I got into cryptocurrencies 2014, um, the biggest challenge back then is the same big, big challenge that we have today. Um, these cryptocurrencies are not really usable. You can buy them and you can hold them and you can look at them and they look and you can pet them and you always think they're really cute and nice, but you can't really spend them. So in 2015, we started this company and with we, I mean, me and my co-founders, um, where it was our mission to make these cryptocurrencies spendable anytime, anywhere, online, offline, any place in the world. And so this company is called 10X. Um, we are one of the largest cryptocurrency companies in the world. Uh, we are among the top 15 cryptocurrencies in the world. Uh, so we really, I mean, this has been really growing because of that actual use case. The way we do it is you can download an app. Um, it's called the 10X app. You download it. You can order a debit card in there. Um, the debit card costs you one time 15 US dollars. We ship it to you. And then you can load various cryptocurrencies into that debit card. So you can put Bitcoin or Ether, Dash, and many, many, many tokens into that card. And then you can use that card online, offline, just like you would use any other credit card. And uh, yeah, you can just spend your cryptocurrencies doing that. And that uh, is uh, yeah, a, a breakthrough for, for many people because now suddenly they can use their cryptocurrencies. And we're the only uh, company in the world who offers one card connectable to various cryptocurrencies and that's uh, quite unique. Wait, 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 wait. That, yeah. that, that's a game changer. So I can basically get a debit card that's backed by whatever exchange or you know, currency that I go with and through the 10X app, I you know, order it, I get my card and I can use it wherever like Visa or MasterCard is accepted? Yes, correct. Wow. So that's the, that's the great part, yeah. Wow. If, you can, if, if we have very good yeah. videos and very good explanation, you can just go to 10x.tech. So that's T E N X.tech. And um, yeah, we have uh, a huge Facebook and Twitter and Slack and all these communities. So wow. yeah, you can find everything there. We have instruction videos and infographics, and it, it's really straightforward. It's like a one, two, three process. Wow. Dr. Haas, again, thank you uh, for your time. If you just can conclude with. Um, you know, again, we talked about how you pivoted, uh, you know, to medicine, then out of medicine. You found your calling. You're living the life you want to live. You're in a disruptive space. And within that space, you're further disrupting. So I love it. Give us like your philosophy in business and life to Julian Hospice today. Um, you know, to give us some advice to the listeners so we can, you know, enjoy some of the same success you're enjoying. I think one of the most important characteristics you have to learn is a characteristic that like Bruce Lee always taught and is you have to be water, my friends. And yeah. uh, water can be in a teacup, water can flow down the river, water can freeze, water can go into the air. What he basically meant was if you want to be water, you have to stay super flexible. So don't be this stuck shape that has to go into some place. No, look at the place, look at the space and fill it and, and understand what's, what's, what's the void, what's empty, and then bring your solution to there. 
And you have to stay super, super flexible to that. And my entire life, this was exactly how it was. I was supposed to study medicine in the US and I was in Italy kite surfing and I had a kite company who said, look, if you don't go to the US, because if you go to the US, you're not going to be able to kite surf. If you study in Austria, then we're going to pay you for the next couple of years. You can travel. We're going to pay for all that. You're going to travel to the most amazing places and you're going to have all these great things. And so, you know, these are opportunities where today many people say, well, duh, of course you would take it. But, you know, during this time it was, okay, scholarship in the U.S., great university in the U.S., yeah. or hmm, uncertainty, kite surfing, what's that going <laughs> to Right? So stay flexible and, 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 and embrace that uncertainty. Uh, stay flexible. When I was in, when I met my co-founders uh, for Tenex, it was a total coincidence. We were in Thailand and I was on holidays. It was a complete coincidence because I was just scrolling through my Facebook and I had a friend suggestion of someone who's from the same city and who's also in Bangkok. That was Toby. And so I just said, hey, that's pretty cool. I'm going to send him a friend request. He's my same age. I have never met him, but he's from the same town that I'm from. Let's send him a friend request. And so I meet him and I was in a totally different mood. I was on stepping away from my old business. I was just in that process of writing a book that you talked about. And now I meet him and he talks to me about cryptocurrencies and about the problem of making them spendable. And, you know, I could just shut down and, and just say, no, you know what? I have my own thing. Don't, I don't care. But I was flexible. I was open-minded. And I think that's so important. Uh, looking at today, what, how many opportunities there are out there. I have friends. They're my age. They make six or seven figures on Amazon with no retail or no anything background. And then I see small and medium-sized businesses who sell goods. And they're struggling because they don't get enough customers. But if I talk to them and say, why don't you sell your stuff on Amazon? Okay. No, I would never want to do this. You know, my business has been working for the past 30 years. I'm not going to change my model. This is what I learned. This is what I do. Uh, I'm not going to transition. No, why? Amazon is bad. Well, if, you, if you're so stuck in that, that's exactly what's going to happen. And, you know, it applies to literally everything that we see out there. You have to stay water, my friends, and you have to be flexible. This is so important. Wow. And um, with that being said, fluidity is key. And, and Dr. Haas, I don't know how I can find a better way to spend 42 minutes. So Dr. Haas, thank you for coming on the New Theory Podcast, folks. It'll be up shortly. And uh